Welcome to K-State Online. I am Mason Voth. That is Derek Young. We are here and ready to go to kick off another week where hopefully things will be much more tame on the K-State basketball front in terms of maybe the panic mode. Uh, you would like for things to probably explode and not be all that calm and good news for K-State basketball because there's the possibility that that could happen with the way that the transfer portal is starting to set up and the way that K-State is going to have kind of the ability to be aggressive in the portal. And we can get into the transfer portal talk with K-State because we already know Doug McDaniel's on board. That's going on about a week now. But there are still some other big names out there and significant players that all across the country are being sought after that K-State is going to be in the mix for, or you would think they might be. And probably the biggest name is Michael Brown Jones, who played his last two seasons at UNC Greensboro, put up really good numbers this year. I mean, he took some massive offensive jumps and certainly brings some versatility that K-State would love to have. Like that's that's the kind of player that would work really well for what this offense needs. So where do, where do things stand with Michael Brown Jones? Because we know that K-State, along with Ole Miss and Pitt, made his final three last week. Yeah, I, there was some, you know, a lot of public reporting that was connecting the two sides there with Kansas State with Mikhail Brown Jones just before, you know, the Jerome Tank went through that process with Arkansas. And it seemed like as soon as that process ended, I don't know if it's coincidentally, maybe, uh, he puts out that, or right before I think it finished, he puts out that top three um, that also includes Ole Miss and Pittsburgh with Kansas State. So, um, yeah, it's it'll be interesting. I'm sure that's going to really, really start to unfold once the dead period is over, the dead period being over April 11th. So, was that for Thursday, I think? Yeah, the last day. So uh, I would expect, and then, then I think it's only a few more days and then another dead period starts up again. So I think it's like a three, four, five-day there period. I would expect Kansas State to have a couple of visitors. Uh, he's certainly a candidate to be one of those, as as I think, you know, just based on things that I hear um, here and there, I would imagine I, I, I kind of put Pittsburgh third on the pecking list right now because it seems like, uh, the two more likely are destinations for him in terms of visits that he'll take are to both Kansas State and Ole Miss. And as you said, um, that would be a valuable addition and certainly, a, you know, someone that would be a really good mix with a guy like Doug McDaniel and obviously Day Day Ames that is still at Kansas State as well. Uh, the, you know, almost 20 points per game, a really good rebounder, really, really good rebounder, obviously. And someone that's he actually transferred down because he started at VCU, transferred down to UNC Greensboro. Despite that, I mean, you're seeing it's, I was about to say gradual upward trajectory, but it is pretty drastic, I would say. Uh, but it, per, he's a player that it's improved each year. So that makes me, you know, have fewer concerns about him tra uh, transferring up, uh, back up even more than he was at, at the start since he was at VCU. Um, the only thing, and obviously a really good around the rim, um, has the the measurables to be a really good defender as well, obviously. But you, you wonder how translatable the three-point shooting is uh, to an extent, just because when you're transferring up, that tends to be something that can fluctuate just a little bit at least. And then when you pair that with his first couple of years where he continues to improve in that area, but it was like, yeah, I'm here, I'm here, and then boom, I'm way up here. Uh, yeah. It seems like an outlier at this point. What I will say is it did boom when he actually shot more volume three. So that's interesting. Yeah, that is good to know. Cause I mean, e even, you know, this past year where he goes 43%, it's not, it's not a high volume. It's, it's basically just over two shots from deep a game, but honestly, like if you can do the other things, but when the ball comes to you and you're open and you can knock it down more times than not, then that's that's something that is very valuable still. So I, I think that the skill is there. And I, I would go and say this, that I, I think this is one that even if you're not like totally plugged in or even if you're on the outside, you don't have to have like all the, the facts and info here. It just feels like momentum wise, K-State is in a really good position in this one. Uh, I think that if you're an outsider and you're just trying to you know pick, like you could be some random college basketball person. I think if you're sitting there right now, you're probably thinking to yourself that, K-State probably is in the best spot to get him because of the momentum they already have with a guy like Doug McDaniel. And then also seeing that, I mean, 
things are going really well, it seems, right now on the NIL front for K-State, which drives a lot of this as well. And again, I, you know, I was kind of surprised. I, I read uh, part of what uh, Doug McDaniel did with D. Scott uh, over at KStateSports.com today, and and I was a little surprised to see how much like the Marquise Noel stuff still resonated with him. And I think that it, that goes to show that there is still some life, and the staff can still sell what they did with some newcomers and guys that were fresh to them, like Keontae Johnson or whoever else you want to say and make it clear, like, we're going to make you a better player. Because I think Arthur Kaluma became a better player this past year. Maybe he didn't ascend to the level that some people wanted him to uh, and that this team needed, but I think he did get better under this staff. Yeah, I think that's fair. And and they certainly aren't really hiding this one, and then they're making a push. You can tell with the retweets of, of the reports that, you know, he put Kansas State in his top three, that he's definitely atop the priority list for the Wildcats at this point. And, and say what you will, I don't know where why this get, kind of gets lost a little bit, but guys, that, you know, they have their share of losses just like every school. But Kansas State has won under Jerome Tang has won a lot of contentious recruiting battles too for good, good players. Mm-hmm. That you know kind of goes to this. So you know, guys that they really really want, they've lost a few, but they've landed quite a few that they've really really wanted as well. You said, you know, we, we dead period ends on the 11th and visits will probably open up for some guys right after that. Is this one that you think could wrap up without a visit? And he's, but obviously he still comes, or do you think that this is uh, one that, Hey, you're going to have to go through this process still where he gets on campus and then you wait like a day or two afterwards for the commitment, similar to Doug McDaniel. I would imagine it's going to be similar to McDaniel. I think the staff likes it, prefers it that way too. Um, I think having those in-person interactions can be pretty informative. And I don't think that, you know, so, you know, sometimes they'll just go with it, obviously. I know teams do that, but, uh, and plus I think he's, you know, pretty insistent on visiting at least two of the schools, not just Kansas state. It would, I would be surprised if he didn't also see Ole Miss. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good news. Another one of the transfer names that's been out there and, and, everybody seems to have been in contact with and certainly there's speculation that k-state is is heavy here clifford omori is a transfer from rutgers that you see the you know the the points per game number and he into double figures you can always use that but really his skill set lends itself to grabbing boards but most of all a rim protector averaged almost three blocks a game last year and you're not going to find many guys in college basketball that do that so do you have any any idea or um, inkling on what the Omori situation might be like, not just at K-State, but how it's going to impact things nationally with others? Yeah, this one's probably so open-ended, uh, quite a bit open-ended still. I don't think we've seen much direction of where it will go, and you know, visits will probably tell the tale, and, and those seem to be concealed to an extent, uh, at least until after the dead period. I, look, I, I think that there's meaningful dialogue happening between Amori and Kansas State, um, but I'm not sure that couldn't also be said about five to seven other schools still at this point. So I think undetermined is probably the best way to handicap his recruitment, and I would say very contentious, um, not with just with the amount of schools interested in him, but the kind of schools. Like, I would be shocked if we're not talking like – Obviously, some of it depends on who stays and who goes at these schools. But, you know, Kansas, Kentucky, St. John's, Miami, potentially UConn. I I don't think there's a shortage of powerhouse programs involved for him. Well, and I also think it's interesting. I mean, you say five to seven schools. I think it could be greater than that. Like, I just think this is one that is it's you're you're not going to know. I mean, it's it's going to be probably a, a longer process and we'll see. And. I think it's good for people to realize too, like some of the guys portal wise at K State's landed. It was, I mean, they didn't get Kaluma until what, like June last year. Like it was legit deep into summer. Uh, obviously, the like Toussaint stuff went down. I think Fourth of July weekend, and uh, I mean the Keontae Johnson different situation, but that played out into August. I'm pretty sure. So it could take a while on some of these, but this is a name that obviously K State probably feels like they'll keep tabs on and see if the the opportunity presents itself. However, uh, the 
the big man market has gotten bigger, which may not be the best of things for a guy like Clifford Amore because we just found out today that Arizona's big. Omar Ballo is also in the portal now, scores it a little bit more in the game, a little bit more efficient from the field than what Omori is and grabs 10 boards a game. I mean, this is a beast of a human being. He's played a couple seasons at Gonzaga and then followed Tommy Lloyd to Arizona. I mean, w- would this be a good fit for K-State and somebody that they could be a serious player for? A good fit because he's probably exactly the kind of big that they'd like to you know, have anchoring the paint for them. Uh, but I think every school in the country would say that as well. So, again, another contentious recruitment. And absent any obvious connections, probably a tough one to land. And and to my knowledge, I don't know if there's a you know direct links from Kansas State to Ballow that would say, oh yeah, you have a chance here or anything of that nature. Um, but it'll be interesting. Uh, they'll they're, they'll clearly want to try. But the, these, I mean, this will the, the bidding war will be pretty high, I imagine as well, um, potentially. Considering the position, the skill set, the demand, uh, I'm not sure there'll be someone that can probably command a larger, uh, I almost said paycheck. It might as well be, but yeah. It basically is, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they they want, they're, they're going to want him, uh, but how much does he want them? I, you know, probably too early to tell. And like, again, for someone like this, where it's going to just be a heated battle. You'd like a starter connection or a tie, like to kind of get you in the door maybe a little bit sooner than others. And I don't know if that exists in this case. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is one that uh, similar to Clifford, but probably even greater than everybody is going to have some interest here and you're going to have to fend off a lot of others. I think the one thing, and we talked a little bit about this on the Sunday show yesterday, but K-State seems to be in a position now where their status is elevated because of Jerome Tang and and what that does for you and and how you're respected amongst the college basketball community. And that goes for these players as well. But in addition to that, we've already obviously seen a greater commitment to NIL this offseason for K-State. And that should give people at least the thought that, you know, this isn't just going to be you see a tweet today that says you know so and so has interest in this guy like we've seen it before k-state over the last three years has interest in this guy in the transfer portal and then you never see anything about it again because the other names on that list were like alabama arkansas kansas you know whoever all these big name schools are like k-state can't compete with that i think k-state's in a legitimate position to compete for more of these guys we just saw it with doug mcdaniel i think we can see it even with some of the guys higher on the transfer portal rankings than mcdaniel so Uh, This will be an interesting one to follow and just see if anything else comes from it uh, on the K-State front because obviously, like you said, he'd be the kind of big that they would love to add. It's just a matter of do you have the connection and can you actually make this thing happen? Uh, We'll see how it ends up working out for this staff. Uh, And and there's a need with Jarrell Colbert walking out. You lost Will McNair. They're clearly going to try to pluck a big from the transfer portal. Yeah. Uh, real quick, because we we brought his name up quite a bit uh, last week because he was one of the first ones to, to get interest. Anything new on the Terrace Reed front? I'm sure people, even if you know that's something that's cooled off, which it seems like maybe it has, but people would still be interested. Hey, we heard this name. What happened to that name? I, w- I wouldn't completely write it off, but as I said uh, at the time, even when he was visiting or the visit was underway, uh, he's someone on the recruiting board, obviously, but I don't think either side is in a hurry to to forge a decision of any kind. Now, does that change with Gerald Colbert entering the portal? Because that kind of happened after the fact, perhaps. And they'll they'll cir- we'll circle back if if necessary. I'm not writing anything off because obviously, you know, Terrace Reed visited Kansas State for a reason, but it seems like both he and Kansas State. They're not like, you know, racing to come to a conclusion at that. I think he probably wanted to kind of see his options. Uh, Kansas State, they brought in Doug right after him, mm-hmm. and it was, you know, full go on him. So I yeah. think uh, we're still in wait and see on that one. All right, moving on. This is nothing related to the transfer portal, but uh, it, it continues to go on. This is more so just shocking news than anything where, you know, it seems like 
Arkansas has nowhere to turn in their coaching search. Jerome Tang says, nope, I'm good at K-State. I'm staying here. Chris Beard did the same thing after it seemed like Chris Beard was going to take the job. And so you're thinking, man, what does Arkansas do now? And then all of a sudden it's like, well, maybe they're going to end up with the best possible option here because all signs indicate that John Calipari is going to be the next head coach at Arkansas. Uh, is Things kind of get – you know, whittled away there, and we'll see if it becomes official by the end of Monday night or if we have to wait a little bit longer. But with John Calipari going to Arkansas, if it happens, that would leave Kentucky wide open for people. Would, in some roundabout way, Arkansas for a second time throw K-State into disarray and make them think that, oh, we've got to try to fight to keep Jerome Tang here, or are, are they going to be good now because of whatever conclusion that Kentucky might come to doesn't impact Tang? Yeah, the, this coaching carousel just keeps going on uh, April 8th, and we're kind of still there on the eve or on the day of the national championship game. Uh, we thought we were probably done there when SMU, uh, but then SMU goes and fires their coach that is actually ascending because mm -hmm. I think they thought that they were probably going to be in the mix for some bigger names. Not that Andy Enfield's not a big name, but I think they were probably – um, betting on somebody different, end up with Andy Enfield from USC. They're probably not apologizing for that. USC swipes, expectedly swipes Eric Musselman from USC, a West Coast guy, um, at least from his time being with the Sacramento Kings, Golden State Warriors, um, a guy that clearly wanted to get back there. And then Arkansas kind of has this, they wanted this quick, abrupt coaching search. Everyone's like, this will only take a couple of days. It takes a couple of days longer than they're anticipating because – they're told no, probably a little bit more than they are. Um, it's surprising that Will Wade also hasn't really factored into any open job mm -hmm. um, as well. That's puzzling to me, but obviously it sounds like Arkansas is going to hire John Calipari, which that seems <laughs> in a roundabout way, a win-win-win for everyone. Uh, Calipari, obviously uh, not in the most happiest of situations uh, with Kentucky fans basically turning on him. And ready for him to ready just to be done with him, uh, and he goes to a place where he can basically restart his career and be appreciated again. Now we'll see how long that lasts. I don't I don't know that John Calipari has a, a reputation of really wearing on people in a positive way over time, but uh, for now I think he'll be happier, and and Arkansas fans are going to be happy too. So for the time being, in Arkansas because of the way their coaching search had been going, this is their opportunity to, one, maybe deceive people and say, this is the guy we wanted all along, and maybe yes. some people will fall for that. We'll be happy to do that. Yeah, and they'll do that. And two, even though that's not the case, and I think everyone with, with a brain can kind of tell that that's not the case, it is their way of saving face. Because Jay, if your fallback's John Calipari, you, you still did pretty good. I mean, I'm not sure I'm bullish on John Calipari, the coach anymore from a championship standpoint. We'll see. Uh, it might be a good match, but at least allows Arkansas to save face because they just swiped away the sitting head basketball coach for Kentucky. Now, I don't think anyone can really say that, but what the Boston Celtics um, when they, when they took Rick Pitino, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then on the other end of that is Kentucky and their administration is probably going to send a bouquet of flowers to Fayetteville, Arkansas, mm -hmm. because one, you got us off the financial hook, and and two, we can kind of get a reboot on what was probably becoming somewhat of a stale basketball job. So a lot went right for everyone involved. It's a weird marriage, but one that makes sense for all three uh, participators. Now, what does Kentucky do? That's the interesting thing. Um, because they're Kentucky, I think that they will want to throw their weight around and get a big-name coach. Who that will be is up in the air. Um, some are obviously linking Scott Drew to the job. He, he, the Drew family, by nature, is was bore out in the Midwest. There's a reason that Homer Drew was in Valparaiso, I think. Uh, and, you know, Bryce Drew hit the three-pointer to win an NCAA tournament game at Valparaiso. I mean, that family is Midwest tied. That's why Scott Drew was linked to the Louisville job. But that job got him exactly the extension that he was looking for uh, at Baylor. So, you know, by all accounts, you talk to people, everyone's going to keep linking into 
the Kentucky job until he probably says, no, I get that. It just, a lot of people would still be pretty surprised if he let Waco, left Waco just because they kind of just gave him everything he wanted a couple weeks ago. So we'll see. Um, it is Kentucky. They do have weight to throw around. Um, how bad does he want to be there? How much does he like it at Baylor? Now, because of all that, what I'm saying is, like, I don't necessarily expect Scott Drew to leave Baylor. If he did, yes. I mean, obviously, there's an obvious connection there from Jerome Tang. Um, but until I hear something substantial that makes me worry, I'm going to step uh, stay off the ledge for now, um, especially since you just saw that outward um, display of loyalty from Jerome Tang. I think it would, it would even because he just did that, I think it would be tough for him to – go back on that, but obviously Baylor is Baylor. I don't think anyone would fault him for going back home, so to speak. So I get that. I just don't know if we're going to get there. I I don't get the sense that Scott Drew is going to be the next Kentucky coach. Um, should you be worried if he is? Probably, obviously. Um, but there's two also schools of thought here that I've kind of thought all along, even before we got to this moment, um, for those in the Scott Drew coaching tree that could be linked to that job, obviously – Grant McCaslin is another one. One, like, uh, is because of their connections there, is this just everything that they've been wanting, uh, like a dream job of sorts because of how long you were in Waco? Or two, do you actually not want the job because of that and you don't want to infringe upon what they may consider Scott Drew's baby as well? I mean, that could be – they yeah. might view that as just his territory. Two completely different schools of thought. I don't know which one it would be. But at this moment, um, you know, I've talked about it for a few minutes. I just don't think there's a lot worth discussing until we absolutely know that Scott Drew would be willing to go to Lexington because at this point, I'm not sure he would. Yeah, that that seems to be the only coaching move in this process that would probably throw Jerome Tang back into this position. And like you said, there's even the chance that given how things played out last week that, you know, maybe his attitude would be different on if, if he wanted to return to Waco. I'm sure it would be hard to turn down, but um, obviously he feels like they're in a good spot at K-State and, and they can work from there. But like the other options, Nate Oates' name has been thrown out there a lot. I don't know that Jerome Tang is leaving for Alabama, although I do think that like Alabama can be an attractive basketball spot because we know the trickle-down effect that a really good football program can have to where – hey, there's money left over, give it to basketball. Uh, but I, I just don't see that happening. Danny Hurley is probably like the you know big picture get that they would like, but you know, does he leave UConn after he likely leads into a second straight national title tonight? Doesn't seem like that's something that there's much steam to right now. Scott Drew would be on that list. Billy Donovan's name has been thrown out there as well. I don't think Jerome Tang is going to be the next head coach of the Chicago Bulls, though. And I don't know. I think Jerome Tang probably knows that he would not work very well in the NBA uh, because it's a totally different ball game coaching in the NBA than it is in college. So I think really it's just if Kentucky were to get to the spot where they they went to Scott Drew, and then number one, Scott Drew has to take the job at Kentucky. And we we talked about it last week, but if you're a good enough coach, you can go to a spot where you make that job that you have a great job that isn't worth leaving. Scott Drew has arguably done that at Baylor. Now, Kentucky is still a far better job than what Baylor is, but Scott Drew is comfortable there, and he knows that he can win there and get guys to Waco. Is it worth going to Lexington and trying to kind of smooth over an angry mob that just forced Calipari out? And are you going to be able to have the success that you want as opposed to Scott Drew is a king. He can do whatever he wants in Waco, Texas for the rest of his life. He is fine to do that. And he's going to keep being successful there. You just add another variable into your career if you do leave that job. So I, I think it's I think it's a low chance that K-State is back in this position. And probably, you know, after today with the initial st- shock value of everything going on with Calipari and Arkansas and Kentucky, probably not worth worrying about or talking about. Uh, unless Scott Drew does become the next coach at Kentucky, because that's really the only thing that I think should have people even remotely concerned about Jerome Tang. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, like, like I said, I, you know, I have people tell me it's very, very unlikely that Scott Drew would leave. And like you said, you, you always want to build the job into something that's worth staying for. I mean, mm-hmm. no one would call Baylor a blue blood. It, but 
they're they're like a rung below that now. Of what they're a new kind of, blood. Yeah, what they've kind of built themselves into. You know, they have a national championship. Um, they can recruit five star players. They can recruit the best transfers, and you know, that's that's hard to leave. But it, like I said, but there there is a few jobs to say. But it's this cool. But it's this cool, and Kentucky's one of those. And when it comes to basketball, like. Yeah. I don't – people might disagree, and, and, and it kind of is gross saying this, but there's only two basketball jobs, in my opinion, right away that I can say is a better job than Kansas. Two. Um, and, and it's only might be, right? It might be just as good. It's Kentucky and North Carolina. Those are the two, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Some people yeah. would say Duke, but Duke's – you get you, there is still limitations at Duke. Um, and not a whole lot of different people have won there. Uh, UConn's probably turning into this. I, I, because it's only happened for two decades, I still pump the brakes, and there's still limitations there, size or resources. But in terms of resources, prestige, tradition, a track record of success, all of that goes into it, and not having these, I would say, slumps that some of these blue blood schools have run into, like Indiana and UCLA. Um, I would say North Car- uh, the only ones that I think you can argue that are better than Kansas are North Carolina and Kentucky. Yeah, and I I mean I I contend I I think Kansas and Kentucky are probably the two best uh because I mean North Carolina is is up and in there but um I just think KU and Kentucky have shown that they've been able to just go out and get whoever they want and make it work whereas North Carolina we know that there's been like some connection there the Dean Smith side of things with how their success has rolled out. I mean, essentially that's what it's been since Dean Smith left. Uh, it's been guys that in some way work back to him. Like even Hubert Davis, it's, you know, he played for Roy Williams. So like how, you know, how, how this all works out, it all makes sense uh, in, in some way or, or what, uh, or he coached under Roy Williams. So I think that it is going to be a fun thing to follow along with on the outside of it. But as a K-State fan, you don't have to worry too much right now about how the Kentucky-Arkansas dynamic is going to impact you now, and you can just move on with it and focus on the transfer portal. So the best place to follow along with the transfer portal, probably even better than right here, is by going to kstateonline.com, find on three, get signed up if you're not, get all the info and insights uh, that you want from K-State Online on recruiting and football, transfer portal with basketball, and anything else that comes up. Uh, as well as just, you know, whatever else is on people's minds that they are floating out there, which uh, one of the things I, I laughed at Mike Gundy's house going for sale in Stillwater, the threat about that today uh, made me laugh. Mainly just some of the comments about the decor inside of Mike Gundy's house. It's it's a fascinating thing to look at. There's no doubt about that. So there, there's a video. I think this is from a, a Lexington TV station. I don't know. Oh, if you've of seen Calipari it. walking his dog. Cal- yeah, Calipari is just walking down the sidewalk, pushing a stroller, so maybe a grandkid or something in it. You can't actually see if there's anything in the stroller, but he is walking a dog. Uh, I have. I almost think that the stroller might be for the dog. I, oh. I, I think. I mean, the dog is beside him in that moment, but you know, if you get too far, the, oh, I wonder if the, the leash, dog in there. I wonder if the leash is on the stroller. And it's just dragging the dog because he does have a phone in the other hand. Maybe when they start asking questions about the Arkansas job, if he had any comment, he says, no, I don't. I'm just walking my dog right now. Yeah. I just, uh, I have no, I have no idea why he would even leave the house at this point in time. Like what, what is the logic and purpose behind that? If you're John Calipari, like, yeah, that's, that seems purposeful. He wanted people to, Talk to him. <laughs> yeah, no, you're absolutely right. He wanted he he wanted people to be able to, you know, go like, oh, hey, John, what's going on? There's the video right there, <laughs> from the CBS affiliate in, in Lexington, and just yeah, very walking around, having a good time. Uh, he's not, he's not even he's, and it doesn't even bother him that they're asking about it. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I I do enjoy how unbothered Calipari is about a lot of these things. So there goes the dog following behind him. Uh, but the dog's not on a leash, so that definitely the stroller is definitely for the dog. Which, as a small dog owner, was something I never thought that I would be. But you know, you get uh, an elderly young female dog, you you just you run with it, and she's been awesome. 
I've never once thought about putting her in a stroller. I'm sure my wife has thought about it. Uh, we did try a lot of the baby items on her beforehand, like the crib and the bassinet and all that stuff. But I would never be caught dead walking my dog in a stroller around my neighborhood. But I don't have Calipari money. So maybe if uh, maybe if Mitzi Voth was uh, a rich dog, maybe she would get to get toted around in a stroller. Instead, we we slum it like the rest of the world and we just walk around on a leash. That's just a, what 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 a scene. This is this is what the coaching carousel in college basketball has turned into, learning that John Calipari is out and about with his dog stroller. So that seems like a fitting way to uh, end the show. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. We're out of here. Thanks for watching.